thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to speak to the NDP Opposition Day motion put forward by my colleague and champion of Canadian municipalities, member for Trinity Spadina. Mr. Speaker, the basis for the motion today is fundamentally economic and is succinctly captured in the Federation of Canadian Municipalities submission to the government on this matter last November. The intro to that submission reads in part, and I quote, Municipal infrastructure provides the foundation upon which our co economy rests. Small businesses need quality roads and bridges to deliver goods and services. Workers need fast, efficient public transit to connect them with jobs. And growing companies count on high-quality community services from libraries to hockey rinks to attract skilled workers. Yet today, those foundations are buckling under the strain. In these terms, Mr. Speaker, support for today's motion seems pretty obvious. And so it is that there is a broad near consensus outside of this House for the motion that we are discussing today. As we'll hear throughout the day, Mr. Speaker, the call for a long-term, predictable, accountable federal infrastructure plan in partnership with other levels of government is supported by business leaders, trade unions, economists, civil society organizations, experts of all kinds, and of course, municipal leaders. Now, I say near consensus, Mr. Speaker, because there are still those that seem to lie outside this consensus, and they are, curiously enough, the two federal parties, the Conservatives and the Liberals, that have swapped power back and forth over the last 40-plus years as they withdrew investment, indeed withdrew the federal government, and watched the foundations of our economy and municipalities crumble. In seven years of government, these Conservatives have yet to even acknowledge the urban reality of the country we live in, Mr. Speaker, the fact that nearly 80 percent of Canadians live in cities. They seem entirely incapable of even imagining a Canadian economy other than resource extraction, a Canadian economy led by the necessarily social, urban process of innovation. And so we get the dismantling of federal environmental framework to facilitate resource extraction in place of a modern and environmentally sustainable economic strategy that sees cities as the place to research, develop, create and innovate and to exploit the enormous opportunities to tackle climate change. The Liberal Party, the same, Mr. Speaker, having reduced infrastructure funding through the 1990s, have never given more than lip service and pennies when real full dollars were called for. And more than that, downloading federal fiscal challenges ultimately to other orders of government, ultimately to our cities, that order of government least able to maintain, much less build infrastructure, collecting as they do only eight cents on the dollar in tax revenue. And so we can watch the trend line of investment in infrastructure as it goes steadily down from its high of about 3 percent of GDP in the late 50s and early 60s to bouncing along the bottom through the latest Liberal majority governments at about 1.5 percent. That difference, Mr. Speaker, represents about $24 billion in missing annual investment in public infrastructure, according to a recent study. That same study, Mr. Speaker, shows that net investment in infrastructure was actually negative for two years of Liberal government as existing public infrastructure stock depreciated faster than new development. Now, if all else had stayed the same, that would be one thing, Mr. Speaker. That would be trouble enough. But the technological, political and economic context has been changing as well over the last 40 years. Broadly, we call it globalization. But the implication is that old ways of governance have to give way to new ways of governance that recognize the political and economic importance of urban regions, urban economies. As one observer put it, Quote, a practical implication is that cities have become central to the study of federalism. So this motion takes place in the context of Canadian federal politics that is and has been for very many years out of step with the rest of the developed world in terms of its understanding and respect for the role of our cities in a global economy in generating wealth for our country. In most other developed countries and economies, governments have become major players in the financial, economic and cultural life of their cities, and it is past time for ours to do the same. 
Instead, we are left with this enormous infrastructure deficit estimated at over $170 billion, a deficit, a deficit so obvious to every citizen of my city, the city of Toronto. And so we have famed urbanist and urban economist Jane Jacobs, who could save Toronto in 1969, quote, here is the most hopeful and healthy city in North America, still unmangled, still with options. By 2004, in her book, Dark Age Ahead, she described the town that she made her home, her own, as, quote, a city in crisis, indeed multiple crises. But one needn't have the keen eye of Jacobs to take note and be frustrated and concerned as the Conservatives and Liberals swap power back and forth over the last 40 years, the contours of these crises, to use Jacobs' terms, became increasingly obvious. And for those who have not witnessed their emergence, as Jacobs did, the transition over 40 plus years has been amply and convincingly recorded in statistics and maps by University of Toronto Professor David Halchansky and colleagues in particular that can take you through 40 years of growing social and spatial inequity and economic decline in a kind of tour de force of time-lapse cartography. The final image that we're left with is a Toronto that has been divided into three socially economically and spatially discrete cities within the city, with great swaths of Toronto's geography characterized by the absence of infrastructure, infrastructure deserts of various kinds, Mr. Speaker. And so we have in Toronto what the Toronto Board of Trade calls a conundrum, a city strong on economic fund fundamentals, but not world leading in productivity, GDP, or disposable income growth with the Toronto region providing nearly 50% of Ontario's GDP and 20% of Canada's GDP, solving this conundrum, Mr. Speaker, seems imperative. The Board of Trade itself points us to infrastructure as what needs to be addressed first and foremost. They describe it as, and I quote, the biggest threat to our continued growth and economic prosperity in the Toronto region and Ontario generally. Now, while the lack of infrastructure and the crumbling infrastructure generally poses an enormous obstacle to Toronto's growth and prosperity. It is public transit that is at the top, that is the top priority of the board's members because of, and I quote again, its outsized impact on the Toronto region's global competitiveness. This is an analysis and a priority shared by many other organizations studying Toronto's economy in the global context. As of 2006, it was estimated that the cost of congestion to the economy of Toronto, the Toronto region, was $6 billion annually. That's an old figure now, Mr. Speaker. The outlook is even more grim, however, as Toronto continues to grow with one of the fastest urban growth rates globally. Every year we add about 100,000 people to our city so that within 20 years, Toronto will be 50% bigger. And absent any significant action, the productivity cost of poor public transit will skyrocket to an estimated $15 billion annually. In terms more easily to relate to, Mr. Speaker, that means that Toronto commuters already experiencing the longest commute times in North America can look forward to spending an extra three work weeks per year stuck in traffic. We are the only OECD and G8 country without a national transit strategy, Mr. Speaker. At our economic peril do we continue to be so. It is well past time for this government to drop its aversion to thinking ahead and put in place, in partnership with other levels of government, a long-term, predictable infrastructure plan. Join the consensus. The crises that Jane Jacobs referred to are, in her terms, the tangible consequences of tangible mistakes. They need not be so forever, Mr. Speaker. We can fix these problems and grasp the great opportunities that lie before us. To start, we should support today's motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bravo.